Hello, and welcome to another episode of Nerd Shit. I believe this is episode six or seven. I'm not quite sure. As always, quick introduction. We are going to talk about things in regards to exercise and fitness from the scientific perspective, breaking down those, you know, I guess you can say ideas into bite-sized pieces so people can actually understand them better. So you can make informed decisions on what to do and what not to do in regard to your training, diet, supplements, so on and so forth quick you know um in my last video on the carbohydrates when i was talking about gluconeogenesis and i was talking about the protein structures and this is why i write things down because um like i said nutrition and dietetics isn't necessarily my area of emphasis when it comes to nutrition um i do know this but like i said sometimes i need refreshers and everything else i failed to mention like the carboxyl group i mentioned the nitrogen group which actually is also the amine group um you know the functional group you know and everything else so just gonna throw that out there just in case some nerd comes across my nerd shit video and says oh he you know got it incorrect i am correcting myself now so you know humbly in front of my audience but anyways um we we're talking about macronutrients we talked about carbohydrates last and we we're going to talk about lipids today because lipids or fat is the one area that i think a lot of people are quite interested in uh, more more so in like the adipose tissue fat but that's not what we're going to talk about today what we're going to talk about is you know dietary fat um, it's a lot more complex than carbohydrates in a lot of ways um, there's a lot more to it so when we're talking about lipids, we basically have three lipid groups. We have simple, we have uh, compound, and we have derived. Um, simple is what we're going to be talking about more specifically because these are going to be the you know things that we're actually consuming within our diet. Simple lipids primarily consist of what are called triacylglycerols, which is a uh, component. Um, it has a glycerol backbone and it has three fatty acid chains attached to it. And as you'll see as I go further down the uh, line that these chains dictate the type of fat that it actually is. So we have, depending on the type of chains, the type of kink that is in it, we have saturated fats. And that basically means that all the hydrogen bonds are accounted for. There's no double bonds present. It's literally a straight chain up and down. So saturated fats are gonna be predominantly found in animal-based products. Not predominantly, they're almost exclusively going to be found in animal-based products. The only exception to this is uh, coconut oil, which is saturated fat, but it's not an animal-based product. So, and then we have unsaturated fatty acids. These are gonna actually have double bonds. So basically there's going to be, um, you know, a carbon-hydrogen bond um, that's sort of, uh, connected to each other in this double bond way. So what happens with the process of hydrogenation is we'll actually um, disassociate those double bonds and add hydrogen to it. And the reason why they do this is because saturated fats at room temperature are solid. Um, at room temperature, unsaturated fats are liquid. And for foods to have a stable cell shelf life, they need to go through a process called hydrogenation. And basically what they're doing is adding hydrogen bonds to the um, unsaturated fat to make it more like a saturated fat will may help it maintain a solid um, temperature or a solid um, you know texture uh, at room temperature. So with unsaturated fatty acids, uh, the delineation between them, you have monounsaturated fatty acids, which means it only has one double bond, and you have polyunsaturated fats, which means it has multiple double bonds. Uh, another interesting thing about you know fatty acids that is different from carbohydrates is there is no essential carbohydrates. However, there are essential fatty acids. Uh, what essential fatty acid basically means is that it cannot be synthesized within the body. It has to be obtained through the diet. Uh, you have the omega-6 fatty acids like arachidonic acid, and then you have the omega-3 fatty acids um, such as uh, uh, alpha-linoleic acid, docosahexaenoic acid, uh, eicosapentaenoic acid, which is obviously the fish oils. You have gamma-linoleic acid. I mean, not to go down the entire list, but basically these are health-promoting uh, fatty acids that obviously have a functional role in the body in terms of like skin health, cardiovascular health, neurological health, uh, internal health, various other things as well. So the interesting thing about fat too is that it can be synthesized within the body relatively easily through a process called esterification. So this is, you know, or tag formation. 
not to go into a huge you know rabbit hole with this but basically if your body has high levels of circulating insulin or if there's a high level of fatty acids in the bloodstream your body will basically convert uh, or store more fat or it will synthesize more fat so it's not something that you're necessarily um, running out of on the opposite side of the spectrum we have um, tag catabolism which is the mobilization and uh, utilization of fatty acids that's nothing we're really going to talk about today because it's getting more into the metabolic side of things and we want to really stick with the uh, fat side of things we have compound lipids uh, which are basically like uh, phospholipids and these are things that you know can make comprise a phospholipid bilayer maintain structural cell integrity so on and so forth and lipoproteins are obviously the you know proteins within the blood that are more, more associated with uh, cholesterol. You have the high density uh, lipoproteins, you have the low density lipoproteins, and you have the very low density lipoproteins. So uh, the, lipo, the LDL or low density lipoproteins are usually going to be the bad cholesterol. These are the things that are going to accumulate and form plaque along the, you know, walls of the vascular system but you have the high density hdl lipoproteins which will usually act as sort of scavengers for those plaques so it's always good and protective to have a high level of hdl in your system and then we obviously have the derived lipids which are cholesterol we have you know uh, endogenous and exogenous cholesterol so basically your body will make its own or you can obtain it through the diet so um one thing I will say though is high levels of uh, cholesterol intake has been associated with coronary artery disease so these are probably going to be something that you want to limit in your body. So I know that was a lot more winded, long winded than it was with the other uh, with the carbohydrates just because obviously there's more of them you have the you know simple you have the compound you have the derived you have cholesterol you have the lipoproteins and phospholipids and then you have the saturated and unsaturated fatty acids as you can see it's quite a mixed bag um, so rolls of lipids in the body and if you see me looking to the left right here it's because I put together a PowerPoint because for me to try to go off the top of my head more more specifically have an organized train of thought so I don't people don't think I'm you know just like looking away from the camera so biggest role for fat in the body is obviously as an energy source and reserve um, your body is constantly going through this sort of shifting between carbohydrate and fat metabolism throughout the day obviously as your energy you know and a lot of things predict this like energy availability predicts this not so much your exercising like if there's a low level of energy availability your body will shift more towards fat metabolism if there's a high level of energy availability let's say you just ate there'll be more of a shift towards fat you know mobilization or storage so it all just depends on your current state of health at that particular time during the day uh, fat also has a vital role within the body to protect vital organs you do have you know like i said visceral fat fat that surrounds the organs and everything else that serves as a protector uh, thermal insulation <laughs> is a big one you do need body fat to basically act as an insulator to you know keep your body warm but also to like absorb heat and other temperatures as well um you know it doesn't just keep your body warm it actually acts as a medium to like basically you know reflect heat in a sense so that's more like you know a different area but basically it helps as thermal insulation and also acts as a vitamin carrier and hunger suppressor as well so I mean, needless to say, you need fat in your body. It's very important. However, you know, you want to get a certain, you know, percentage of fat within your body. So it does have a role. It's not something that you want to avoid. Um, with the advent of keto and everything else gaining popularity, fat has definitely had a huge turnaround than it did 20 years ago. However, I think we need to be responsible in understanding not only the different types of fats, but the functional roles that they play in the body. So. For the average person, your fat intake will usually, you know, be, you want it to be around 20 to 25% of your total caloric intake. You need that, obviously, for a lot of functional reasons. You need cholesterol for hormone formation. You need uh, the essential fatty acids that cannot be synthesized through the diet. So of that 20 to 25%, you really want to keep your saturated fat very, very minimal, uh, less than 30 grams a day. So that's pretty, pretty low. I mean, so that's you know 
a slice of meat with some you know trace fat on it and things along those lines why is that why is there is this why is there a discrimination between saturated fat and the other fats saturated fat seems to be the most compromising when it comes to health due to its effect on you know cholesterol due to its effect on lipids and due to its effect on its ability to you know basically cause coronary artery disease so this is definitely something that we want to avoid i know there's a lot of people out there now who think like oh yeah there's no link between saturated fat like it's definitely something that can rob your health on the flip side of that polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fats tend to be health promoting now this is not saying that we should be redlining ourselves with polyunsaturated fatty acids or monounsaturated fatty acids. However, they have a very functional role in the body. They promote health. And of that 20 to 25%, I would definitely say you would want to get most of that from these sources. So where do you get them from? Olives, avocados, nuts, seeds, fish, anything along those lines. Um, more specifically, the fish oils, uh, I mean, you don't just necessarily get them from fish, you can get them from algae as well if you're a vegan, but like the fish oils, DHA and EPA are extremely health promoting, they're anticoagulant properties in terms of, you know, being able to maintain a healthy vascular system, their effects on neurological health, their effect on cell health, um, their effect on inflammation in the body. So if you're not eating at least two to three servings of fish a week, I highly recommend supplementing Supplementing with fish oil anywhere from two to three grams a day seems to be a baseline but that's more of a gen generic recommendation everyone else is going to be different so um, in terms of uh, burning fat and everything else I might as well just talk about it you know there's studies that show that there is increased fat burning with an increased fat intake people have to realize that your body really just goes off of availability and also, you know, your current state. Like if you're in a fasted state and your glycogen levels are low, you will see a increase in fatty acid mobilization and utilization. So when I say mobilization, utilization, it means <laughs> they're two different things. One is lipolysis, one is beta oxidation. Back on <laughs> topic. In these states, your body is going to shift more towards a fat source for energy. Also with prolonged exercise, your body will shift more towards a fat uh, source for energy. And that also has to do with the same thing with blood glucose levels being low and glycogen being almost completely depleted. It's just what your body does. So if you're on a diet that is almost exclusively fat and there's very limited carbohydrates, it makes sense that you will be burning more fat for energy. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to burn more body fat for energy. How much body fat you actually burn and lose and everything else really depends on your total energy intake throughout the day, how much you consume versus how much you burn. So don't be misled by these studies and thinking like, oh, I'm turning into a fat burning machine. You are burning fat that's in the bloodstream. <laughs> You're burning fat that is obtained through the diet. You are not mobilizing more fat out of the adipose tissue to be utilized as energy. That is a very, very big distinction I think that we should make. So when it comes to the whole, you know, grand scheme of things, I definitely think that you should be getting most of your fats through, um, you know, polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fatty acids. Try to keep your saturated fat intake as minimal as possible. Fat does have a role in the body. However, when it comes to performance, um, if you're training for a very, very prolonged period of time, it's good to have a good mix of fat and carbs. However, carbohydrates is going to be your primary fuel source for high performance, so keep that in mind. Um, I know I didn't talk about digestion like I did with carbohydrates and everything else because it's a little bit more complex because obviously fats go through the lymphatic system it doesn't go into the straight into the bloodstream like carbohydrates and proteins do you know obviously they get converted into chylomicrons and then they get basically you know transported through the lymphatic vesicles and then you know will be utilizing energy in, in a you know i guess you can say more abstract way however we're not going to talk about that so that is fat everybody in a nutshell all the different types, um, how you use them for energy, their functional roles in the body and everything else. So if you leave this video um, with anything, know that you want to be consuming fat, 
you want to be consuming the right types of fats, which are the essential fatty acids, which cannot be synthesized in the body. They have to be obtained exogenously because they're not produced endogenously. Uh, your fuel source as a substrate really depends on your current state, like whether you're fasted, not fasted, the duration of your training. And just because you eat more fat doesn't necessarily mean you're going to burn more body fat. That is largely predictive of your overall caloric intake. Anyways, I'm gonna drop the mic for now because we're gonna talk about the most complex of them all, which is protein. And the reason why it's complex is because protein has so many functional roles in the body. We're not gonna talk about that today. That's on the next nerd shit talk, but proteins can be hormones, proteins can be enzymes, protein can be used to produce tissues, proteins can go through a variety of different processes. Protein can be, you know, converted into glucose, proteins can be converted into fat. Proteins have so many functional roles in the body and from their breakdown to everything else. So it's definitely probably gonna be a 20 minute video. I tried to keep this one short, but stay tuned for that. Anything, anyways, that is nerd talk, everybody. Got to finish with an obligatory flex. Take care and have a good day.